So what are the challenges? As I said, how do we synthesize these milestones into larger global representations of competency that reflect those activities that truly define the profession? That's something that are very grounded, things that we do all the time as program directors and faculty. Well, one technique is that these activities have been described as entrustable professional activities, or EPAs. And I want to spend a little bit of time describing this concept. So here's the definition, and this comes from uh, Ola Tenkate, who's in Holland, who came up with this very nice, what I call, bridging concept that I think pulls all this together. An entrustable professional activity represents the routine professional life activities of physicians based on their specialty and subspecialty. The concept of entrustable means a practitioner has demonstrated the necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes to be trusted to independently perform this activity. Now, if you think about it, we do this all the time. One example of an entrustable professional activity, particularly for interns in internal medicine, is that technically by six months in the outpatient clinic, we can let them see patients on their own, and we don't have to go in and sign out every patient or see every patient to make sure what the intern has just told us in sign out actually matches what's happened within the room. We let them do that through what's called indirect supervision. That's an entrustment. We entrust that that intern has sufficient medical history and physical exam skills that they can now see that patient on their own and simply sign out to us what happened during the visit. And we believe that that's sufficient. But in order to believe that's sufficient, we gotta entrust that they have those skills. And so EPAs become the kind of linking concept that can help us make sense of this. Now, one of the ways to think about EPAs is that we have, as I just mentioned, these entrustable trainee activities. So you could think of them as ETAs. And they help define important landmarks in a trainee's development. So again, if we think about a landmark, it's an event that marks a turning point or stage. We already have a number of those built into our training programs. I just mentioned one in internal medicine. Another is at the end of internship in internal medicine, you now lead a team. You are now the head of the team as an R2 or R3 resident. You manage the interns and the students with indirect, sometimes direct, faculty supervision. Oftentimes, that supervision may be through a telephone call, but you're now in charge. And so that's an important landmark, an entrustable activity we give to R2s that right now is purely time-based. So ETAs in the training program mean that a trainee has demonstrated the necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes to be trusted to perform this activity without constant or direct supervision. So I would ask you again to think about what are some of those critical ETAs in your specialty, the things that you entrust on a regular basis within the program, and how confident or comfortable do you feel that you're making those entrustments with a degree of confidence and accuracy you know, based on the way your program is currently designed? Now, how can ETAs help us assess competence? Well, first off, it allows us to sample events that are critical moments in residency training. As I mentioned, you don't have to sample all 141 milestones. If you pick those critical moments, that allows a broad sampling that may be sufficient. It can inform developmental progression. Faculty and leaders already implicitly assess many of these. We just haven't really formalized it yet. They're often manageable for busy training programs if they're designed well. And they're logical for the assessment with regard to stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean the public and the policymakers. If we want somebody, for example, to be able to manage a panel of chronic disease patients, a very important and trustable professional activity for a general internist, we can design assessment and curricular activities to make sure that that actually happens. We also know that it's supported by generalizability theory. Again, a theory that comes from psychometric that tells us that eight to 12 well done focus assessments can potentially allow a generalized statement of competency if those assessments are well designed and well executed. The other thing we can do is we actually can assess multiple competencies for each entrustable activity. That's the beauty. So we don't have to pick out each little competency. We can collect them and synthesize them within an entrustable activity. It allows for assessment of that competency in context. I just mentioned a very important one, managing a panel of complex you know, patients with diabetes, for example. Well, that involves all six general competencies to be able to do that. It also aligns assessment with the resident's anticipated level of responsibility. So again, we could assess the PGY-1 residents for demonstration of behaviors that'll be necessary in that PGY-2 year. I just mentioned a really important one, 
leading a team where you're responsible for admissions, managing all the patients on that service. So in a sense, the entrustable training activities become the EPAs of residency. And this is just a nice way to represent it. This is from Kelly Kawasaki, who's an associate program director at the Henry Ford Health System. And he just highlights that you can roll up a series of milestones into a particular trustable trainee activity and then use focused assessment and evaluations to determine whether or not they've met that. And then the committee, the competency committee, reviewing the file or portfolio of a trainee can then determine if meeting those entrustable trainee activities designates or is likely to correlate with being able to perform the entrustable professional activities upon graduation from the program. So if we think about pulling all this together, this is just a diagram to help do that. So you'll notice in the left-hand column are the six general competencies. And then each competency has a series of milestones that I showed you earlier embedded within it. Now that's the kind of analytic piece of it. We can break these apart to make better sense of them, and there is value in that. But we can then synthesize to both educate and evaluate by looking at these important and trustable activities. So let's take, for example, again, leading a resident care team. That's an entrustable activity that should then predict or correlate with the ability to lead a healthcare team once they're out in practice. Likewise, to care for a clinic patients with distance supervision should correlate with whether or not they can practice independently. An example I gave was the care of chronic patients. And then finally, are they able to complete an audit or a performance measure of the panel of clinic patients? The reason it's important to be able to do that and the trustable activity is that they're someday going to need to lead a quality improvement initiative in their practice. So you can see that by combining the milestones and synthesizing them into these entrustable activities, we see direct links of what they're actually going to have to do in practice. And now we can begin to create these shared mental models and frameworks so that we're all operating on the same page and that we're talking the same language. That's good for us as faculty but it certainly helps us with trainees in making sure they understand what's expected of them, what it is they need to do to get better, and also to give the program a level of competence when it makes the determination that this person is ready to graduate from the program. So how might we operationalize this? Well, let's take a step back and think about what we do as clinicians. We use something called illness scripts or patterns of behavior all the time, or patterns of illness to make diagnoses. Well, the same principle can apply, be applied here. So if we think about having an entrustable activity, and if we have good assessment like through direct observation, you can use this kind of non-analytic process of pattern recognition in your trainees. It's intuitive us to clinicians, and I'm willing to bet that if you take a step back, you can easily describe somebody who is your best trainee, somebody who's really stellar, and a trainee who really struggled. What was the pattern that described what that individual looked like? Why were they not doing well or incompetent versus somebody who was highly competent and on that accelerated path? What was that pattern? What does that script look like, that competency script? And so these kind of scripts can be very helpful. And as long as the script is accurate and correct, using this kind of pattern recognition can be very valuable and is very legitimate in determining the learner stage. And so you know, think about that in your role of a clinician the same process can apply as an educator. But sometimes we get that training we're not really quite sure. They're struggling but we don't really know why. And here we can go back to kind of more hypothesis or hypothetical deductive type reasoning. Something we all do as clinicians when we're not quite sure it's going off the patient. This is where milestones can be helpful. They become your review of systems. You can look at the more specific milestones to figure out what is going on with this trainee and break it down, use a more analytic instead of synthetic approach to figure out why the trainee's having trouble. And then you can use those milestones to provide rich feedback to the trainee and says, you know, within this competency of patient care, you're really having a hard time picking up the nuances on that medical history and physical exam. And you missed a couple critical subtle findings on physical exam that actually would have helped make a more proper diagnosis of this patient. Those kind of specifics now allow you to do a diagnosis of what the problem might be with the trainee. And so that's where the milestones and the EPAs come in, and we can go back and forth between them, just like we do with patients, to figure out what's happening with the trainee.